Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, the DeKalb County Public Library, and the Decatur Arts Alliance, welcome to another in our series of artist talks in conjunction with The Book is Art, Volume 8, Infinity. As many of you are aware, our Book is Art show that we hold annually at the Decatur Library was, of course, canceled due to the COVID-19 global pandemic. Because of that, we've kind of had to rethink how we do our art show and have moved it online. And thanks to our YouTube channel, you can go and view that entire show in a sort of walkthrough, um, going from piece to piece to where you can see each show piece as it appeared in the show. We also developed a series of author talk, artist talks like our author talks. Tonight, of course, we will feature Peggy Johnston and Joe Sanders. Joe was one of the jurors this year and Peggy's piece, Scorpius Anomalous, placed third in this year's show. I'd like to take a moment to also thank the DeKalb Library Foundation. They are the fundraising arm of our library system and they raise funds and pay for things outside of what the tax dollars cover. Programs like A Thousand Books Before Kindergarten and Take the Internet Home, where patrons in our library system can take home small Verizon jetpacks to access the internet in order to go to class, find a job, submit resumes, or even register to vote. So we thank the DeKalb Library Foundation for paying for the Zoom account to come into your homes this evening. Right now, I would like to remind you also that after our formal presentation, if you would like to ask the artists a question, feel free to type it into the chat or use the Q&A feature at the top or the side of your screens. We'll ask those, of course, in turn, once a formal presentation is over. I would like to thank you once again for allowing us to come into your homes this evening. And right now I would like to turn it over to Joe Sanders and Peggy Johnson. Joe. Thank you, Joe. And hello everybody. I, I hope we have a nice uh, participation level out there. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, it's been my honor to be a juror for the show. And I did get to see the show in person very, very early on, right after they installed it, and it's a fabulous exhibition, and congratulations to all of the participants. Um, I'm really delighted tonight to talk to Peggy and to get a little bit of insight about some of her work, uh, especially the work that she uh, was able to get in the show, uh, which placed third in the exhibition. It's a fabulous work. So uh, Peggy, how are you tonight? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Uh, so uh, for our audience, um, could you just describe uh, what brought you into Oops. the field of papermaking and book arts? Say that again, I'm sorry. Uh, what brought you into the field of papermaking and book arts? Maybe well, describe your voyage. I just have always, um, paper's been a common denominator in my art all my life. I've painted on it, drawn on it, printed on it, poured on it, pulped it, sewn it. And I also love containers. So it's kind of natural that my love of paper and containers would come together in the book arts. Did you and have the book arts training? incorporate so, so many different um, aspects of science and art. There's physics, there's chemistry, there's math, there's drawing, painting, printing, writing, calligraphy. You could put a myriad things into one nice little compact, intimate piece of art. Very nice. Well, um, did you receive some formal training in paper making and book art somewhere? I have studied, well, not formal as far as going through a program at a university. Mm -hmm. I have taken um, classes from some of the top, you know, workshops and classes from some of the top people in the fields. And I have attended quite a few of an event called the Paper and Book Intensive, which um, is an annual intense series of um, seminars and workshops and classes that goes for 10 days. And um, amazing amount of knowledge that can be gathered from that. And those classes are usually taught by, you know, some of the top people in their field. So. Well, that's fabulous because, you know, it's nice to see that some of those 
uh, types of training, the summer book intensive are working so well uh, for many individuals, including yourself. Um, now I noticed on your website that you were the founder and proprietor of uh, Waveland Studio. Could you tell us a little bit about Waveland and uh, what that is and how that functions? Well, it sounds grander than it is. And that's because I needed a name for my website when I decided to do a website. And when, you know, writing things and descriptions and stuff, I wrote it all. So it sounded like it was a big deal, like there are many people, but it's just me. And this is one of the bedrooms in my house. And um, that's where I make my art. The bedroom next door has my office and all my teaching supplies in it. The basement has all my printmaking stuff and letterpress and a paper, a big flat file full of yet more paper. And the attic is full of paper and book cloth and stuff. So I've taken over about half the house. <laughs> now, what part of the country do you live in, uh, Peggy? I'm in Des Moines, Iowa. Okay. Now, uh, you've been making books for a lot of years. Um, and uh, you said in your website that you'd made over 1,500 uh, pieces. I mean, that's an incredible level of productivity. Um, how would you describe your practice as evolving over the time frame that uh, between when you started out and, and today? Well, it's up to over 2,500 books now. <laughs> and I started with a little class at our art center where I learned a few basic books and it, it just, I got hooked. So I started learning more and looking for other opportunities to learn more about it. And so I started with, um, you know, standard traditional type books like a Japanese binding or a Coptic binding. And then as often as I got a chance to learn and made models of historic bindings. And then uh, gradually, you know, I would learn to make an end band, for example, and that would give me the idea of maybe what if I made that three end bands tall at the top of something and exaggerated some of the book binding techniques in my pieces so they gradually became more and more sculptural. Or I might wonder, well, I have this um, box of old vintage uh, laboratory filter papers. What if I dyed those with onion skin dye and then sewed them into a, a sphere? Sorry about that. That's my husband's hotspot phone. Not a problem. I can show you a picture of, a, of, of that one if you want. Oh, well, that'd be great. Do you Thank want me? You. Okay. This is called Radiolaria, and this is the one made out of the filter papers. It's actually in the museum, National Museum for Women in the Arts in Washington, oh. D.C. Congratulations. Thank you. That was a big fat deal for me, I got to say. They have three of my pieces. Anyway, this is an example where I did a double headband. And then these little copper filaments are... Um, out of a telephone. I don't know what they do exactly, but it's on a spool in an old telephone. So it's fun to use things like that. So I'm okay. going to un undo this now. Okay. So no, Peggy, you describe, yourself, you describe yourself as a sculptor who makes books. Um, and I noticed like in one exhibition, you had presented over 30 sculptural pieces of book art. Um, just a fraction of the works that you've made. And, um, you know, tell us a little bit about your, how your sculptural pieces happen. Maybe describe some of your inspiration and the materials and some of the experimentation related to your sculptural book works. Well, for example, the um, piece in your, sh in your show with the, um, the Scorpius Anomalous, should I put the picture up? Absolutely. I will, okay. Okay, so this one 
I have this um, really stiff um, vellum paper that when you get it wet, it curls up and becomes very alive. And so I thought I like to warp paper and do other things like that to get some textures going on. Or So I cut a bunch of circles and I, I just want to see what happened if I sew, sewed together, you know, 300 circles, little signatures. And, and then I, I decided it needed to be stabilized. So I sewed them to a strip of plastic. Does the cursor show when I do this? Yes. Oh, okay. So I sewed them to a strip of uh, flexible plastic stuff that's actually what's used for really cheap bathroom um, shower backings and um, added some beads and some little circles made out of, let me zoom. These circles are made from uh, punched out of milk jugs. So anyway, I got it all together and then it wouldn't do anything. It just fell over and looked stupid. So I decided it needed to have something to cradle it. And that's where the, the pod part came from. And I wanted to put wheels in it, but that didn't work. So this is what ended up. So I had no idea when I started this, what it was gonna be in the end. I didn't know what it was gonna look like at all. I just it just it controls me I don't control my art I have no idea most of the time what it's going to end up being so you're really this. kind of an explorer aren't you in in, in your uh, book art work and you seems like you have a strong sense of improvisation you know as well as a great uh, keen eye for materials and problem solving um, and you know sometimes when you put yourself in a place where you have to kind of work yourself out of a, of a problem, uh, you might result in some of your best pieces like this piece. Um, and I know that the jurors really love this piece a lot. Uh, they, uh, they exclaimed about it quite a bit. And of course, we all had our own interpretations of what the, uh, what the form was, but it's definitely reminiscent of some sort of natural form. And I noticed that uh, some of your work, uh, some of your other work uh, from the um, uh, from the series, I think you called it uh, Stones series, you know, had a lot to do with things that you find and um, objects that one might come across in a tide pool or in a field. Um, could you talk a little bit about your relationship to your subject matter and, and what some of the inspirations are for that? Uh, I know that living in the Midwest may be part of that. Um, well, I tend to just accumulate things and then they'll give me an idea at some point. Um, I was so busy trying to unshare that I forgot what you said, I'm sorry. Uh, we were just talking about the series that you did called um, Stones. Oh, the River Rocks. Uh, yeah, yeah, the River Rocks. Well, you know, those were, yeah. I did that very early in my, that was one of my earliest sculptural things, not long after I just began bookbinding. And I had uh, been in an um, art fair where there was a woman who had these wonderful containers that she made out of Corian that would hold messages. And I loved the, the way they looked. And I thought, hmm, I want to make something like that. And so I carved balsa wood and covered it with a paper made by a Iowa paper maker that he calls granite. And um, that's where they came from. And then they needed to have a way to stay shut. So then they would get a a cord. Here, I, I can show you one. Here's one. This one's called Tide Rock or something like that. And uh, so it's got a little copper loop right there. This is a little wooden peg attached to this cord that wraps around it and holds it closed. So um, I did quite a few of these. 
where they had different papers. This is not the granite paper. This is a marbled, some of that cheesy, um, cheap Indian marbled paper where they just throw the color on and it's all wonky. But um, it looks kind of like a rock. So really yeah, that gonna... was kind of the beginning of you and your voyage towards sculptural books. And mm -hmm. uh, what year was that uh, type of work being made? Oh, 97, 98, mm -hmm. maybe. And then, you know, I've, this, I've, I've still make them once in a while, but they're really a lot of work. And you, you know, so I haven't been doing it much. Have to move on, right? So would you describe your current work as uh, you're looking for ways to move a little faster? Maybe your um, ideas might try to outpace your production um, so that you're, you know, you're trying to keep up with your stream of ideas with your work. Well, don't think that all 2,500 books that I've counted are sculptural pieces. A lot of them are just, you know, blank journals and I have a line that's a knockoff on the traveler's notebook and, you know, plenty of that kind of stuff. But I do have a pretty, I probably have 40 or 50 sculptural pieces. And they actually take a lot longer now to make than a river rock. For example, the sewing all those 200 and some circles for Scorpius Anomalous that took a long time. First, I had to cut them all by hand and then warp them and then sew them. So, you know, they're, they're really involved. There's, let me show you um, another one. Is that okay? Yes, to, thank you. Okay. This one is called Caterpillar and it's, it's four feet long when it's stretched out. And there's, I think 250 signatures sewn to the, um, there's a, um, you can see this um, along here, this accordion. That's um, guard material from an old, uh, for making old ledgers that a friend of mine gave me. And then they would sew the signatures to that and do these great big ledges led that for the state. And then once that was all sewn together, I sewed it to the strip of leather with these beads. And I probably punched um, at least 2,500 holes in this leather to do the sewing. But what inspired the piece were these copper pins. And they're, um, I don't know if you can see this one right there. They're for pulling dents out of cars and they're, um, they're just so pretty. So I wanted to use them in something. So that was how this piece ended up being four inches wide by as long as it is, because I my plan was to use up all 500 of the pins, but in the end only half of them would fit. So I can make something else with the rest. These fibers are, it's a monofilm that I got from a garage sale, a huge spool of it. And I just, you know, like the hairiness of it. I've used that in quite a, whoops, quite a few pieces, so. So you had mentioned journals at one point and uh, I have a question related to that. Um, you know, many of us uh, during COVID have begun gardening and cooking more. And I noticed one of the things in your series was called the Heirloom Garden Journals. Uh, are you a gardener and, and how have you um, been impacted by the pandemic and how has that changed your creative practice? Well, let's see, first of all, we have a very shady yard with black walnuts and it's really hard to grow much of anything. So I'm a lousy gardener but I have a lot of hostas. Um, COVID, actually I love to be at home and I love to be in my studio. So it's, it's, it's been good. I've had, um, I've created probably 
four or five new pieces since this all began. And um, right now I don't have anything going. I have to figure out a Christmas card, I guess, next. But um, it, um, it doesn't, I mean, I kind of miss seeing people. I miss going bowling and I, but I don't miss um, people as much as I thought I would. So uh, I, you know, I see my husband and I see my kids and that's pretty much my bubble right now. Are you in so a rural have, type environment? No, I'm right smack in the city, right near right Drake University. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so uh, speaking of uh, university, uh, I noticed that you had done a little teaching and um, I know that uh, you're doing some workshops here and there. Have you been able to maintain any of that kind of activity over the past year? No, I, no, I haven't. And um, sometimes I teach work shops in my own studio but you know that's that's too close of contact now so that's all on hold i haven't figured out how i could as i said before how i could do it virtually so um not right now but it'll be back well it sounds like one of the things that you've relied upon you know is your work with the uh, book intensives and i know that you're a member of the Guild of Book Workers, have you been able to maintain any connections uh, through, uh, you know, any of those organizations or, you know, whether it be friendships or other things that have helped kind of keep you going? Um, I'm not very active in the Guild, but I am a member. And uh, I, every tr three years, they sponsor an exhibition that travels around the country. And I apply for that, and I've been lucky enough to be juried into, I don't know, several. Um, I'm really isolated here in Des Moines as far as other book binders. There really aren't any except people I've taught, and they're not, they're less serious about it than I am, I guess would be a good way to put it. So um, I just kind of do my thing all by myself. Well, we're happy to have you here with us today, Peggy. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity to hear about your work and, you know, hear you discuss some of your pieces, especially the uh, Scorpius Anomalous piece. The piece in the show is fabulous. And I'd love to hear the details about that. Um, is there anything else you want to share with the audience before we go to questions? Well, I, sh I should mention like Scorpius Anomalous, um, a lot of times I just make up phony Latin names for my organic, because my, my shapes are mostly organic. So I'll just make up a, a fake Latin name. And the other way I title work is I have a pictorial dictionary and I'll look through that until I see something that looks kind of like what I just made and we'll use that for a name, which is where Radiolaria, for example, came from. So otherwise, um, I don't know. I mean, I could talk for hours, but I don't really have anything particular to add. Well, thanks very much for your time tonight. And uh, I guess, uh, Joe, uh, we can open it up and see if there's any questions from our audience, if that's a good time for you. Absolutely. And, and, you know, don't forget that you all can type into the chat or type into the Q&A if you'd like to ask um, either of our guests tonight any questions. Uh, Peggy, though, I have to say, you, you've been in several uh, of the book is art shows. And what I always thought was fascinating is you had this very organic, almost crustacean-like um, sculptures um, that you submit, um, you know, your one in the airport show it was was lovely as well but every year we get it I, I feel that there's this some kind of magnificently strange creature that we're going to unbox from you um that always has you know the, these gorgeous beads and things attached to it um and what impresses me the most is that although they seem um very supernatural there there's a very organic earthiness to them all um so you know I, i'm wondering you know how i know you said earlier that you know your art just sort of takes you but um 
you know, do you have any, any sort of like natural inspirations or anything like that when you're sort of like percolating on a new work? And um, I also have to say that I think your boxes are magnificent. Um, I know a lot of folks don't get to see those um, when we do the show, but um, even Scorpius Anomalous had that wonderful blue box, um, you know, with all of the block blocks that held it in place. It seemed almost like a, um, you know, a biological specimen box. Um, and, your, and your just work just seems so deliberate that way too. It, it does seem like, you know, we're unboxing some mythical creature. Um, <laughs> well, good. That's, that's what I'd like it to do. And I should say that um, sometimes making the box is almost more work than making the piece because I'll make this thing and then I have to have a way to ship it where it's going to arrive intact. And I love the challenge and the engineering of coming up with a box that will hold it. And the one for Scorpius really almost looked like some kind of machine to me. It, it Once did. everything was in there. Yeah, with, with the silver on the inside. Too. And, and, you know, that brings up an interesting point with that. When I saw it, too, I almost saw it as if, um, you know, it was some sort of like part um, organic, part mechanized creature with that, the, the almost like exoskeleton that was holding all of the little coils in it. Um, but, you know, I, and then looking at the box and then looking at the piece too. I mean, it, it's very, you know, the box is very geometric and, and holding the piece in there and, and the piece is so very fluid, um, you know, when you see it. So I'm definitely a fan of your work. So. Ah, oh, shucks, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but so um, I know you talked a lot about the, the leather and using the milk cartons and things like that. Um, you know, I mean, do you, you find yourself almost thinking of your, yourself and your, your work as like a, a found piece artist? Um, did you, are you the kind of person that, that looks at a milk carton and goes, gee, I'm going to save this because I can use it for something else. Or, or is it just, you happen to be walking by those great pins and think, oh, I think I can do something with this. Well, that's what happened with the pins. I was at a car swap meet with my husband mm -hmm. and because he's a gearhead and I'm not, but I love to look at those booths with all the bits and pieces. And that's where I found that. Mm -hmm. So I, I just knew someday it would become something, but I didn't know what yet. Mm -hmm. And the same with, um, I thought of milk cartons. Uh, I like the translucence of it, but you know, I don't have a whole bunch of them sitting around. I just... No, I was trying to make pages for a book out of a milk carton and it, it didn't work very well, but you know. Hmm. Peggy, I could just see you surrounded by bins and boxes of, of all kinds of possible materials to use for your work. Can you see behind my, um, my card catalog with the stuff on the top there? And in the cupboard, there's like a thousand little postage stamps in that little cupboard. And there's um, uh, philodendron stems that I probably illegally brought back from Florida. Mm -hmm. And there's snake grass. And then there's a bunch of egg cases from some kind of sea life that I picked up in Florida. And I haven't figured out yet what, but um, they'll probably end up as a part of something Well, it's a fabulous story. I mean, I, I just enjoyed so much hearing from you about your work tonight. And I uh, just want to congratulate you again on the show. And I hope to see some more of your work in the future. Uh, do you have any upcoming things that you want to let folks know about? Or is there any, uh, any future uh, projects that you have in mind that you're thinking about doing? Well, I um, just took down an exhibit called Supernatural in uh, Ames, Iowa at the Octagon Gallery. And so that's done, but I have a piece that is also made with found, I used to have dumpster diving privileges at a bindery. So I 
had a lot of the salvage of mull, which for people that don't bind books, it's the reinforcement that goes in the spine. And I wound that into a ball with um, the uh, lines from one of the Sherlock Holmes stories and called it having a ball with Sherlock Holmes. And then I built a box for it that looks like um, a travel case. And that's at the University of Denver right now in their library. Like yours, no one can see it, but it's there. And um, otherwise, I don't, I think everything's back right now, except for Scorpius, which I just got a message that it'll be coming back soon. So, um, nope, that was the big deal was this latest exhibit. And now there'll be a little quiet spell, I think. Well, it sounds like you'll make the best of those quiet spells to me that you'll be industrious and busy back in the studio. And uh, it sounds like maybe the boxes might be a future uh, project for you. According to Joe, he thinks that your boxes are great. And it sounds like you might be making some art about boxes. So, uh, you know, that uh, that's something always to consider, I guess. Well, I actually have, when I, ha I had a show in Connecticut about 10 years ago, and they actually did put out my boxes in cases as display to display as well, which I thought was really nice. So I don't know, I think it would be fun to have the boxes on display and the pieces not necessarily next to each other and let people see if they could figure out which box held which piece. I don't see it happening, but I think it would be fun. It does sound fun. It, it, it does, you know, we're, we'll probably start thinking about themes for next year's show and I made a couple notes. I, I like the the whole hidden aspect, the, the what's in the box aspect and um, you know how like our show, you know, no one could get in to see your other piece and it's like, oh, that's, that's kind of this air of mystery, you know, being kept out of, uh, you know, the library being kept out of a gallery. It's almost like, um, you know, not being allowed into the good section of the Vatican Library. You know, we, we know all the good stuff is kept. Oh, well, this too will go away and we can, I hope, get back to normal, whatever that'll be. Well, I know oh, that the, uh, Joe's uh, and his crew over there are making the best of it uh, at this time and uh, they do some incredible work there. Oh, thank you so much, Joe. Well, once again, I just want to remind anybody, we have a, a few minutes if anybody has a last minute question. Um, also want to remind you all that you can go to uh, decaturartsalliance.org. Allie has put the um, link in the chat section and you can access the full catalog there. And you can also find the link to our YouTube channel um, or like I said, you can see the opening night tour of the full exhibit, plus all of the artist talks that we've been doing thus far. And we've also been debuting on Tuesdays, small um, short videos uh, that the uh, artists provided us with to kind of give you a, a little bit more time with the piece. Um, and unlike the um, gallery opening show, there's not me doing voiceover. So you can listen to or look at the art unmolested by my voice um, and, and doing the artist descriptions. And Peggy, I do want to remind you when you do get Scorpius Anomalous back, you know, don't forget to check the box because we will be tucking in a, a lovely um, glass medallion um, from Decatur uh, glass oh. for your win. Yes. That'll go in a place of honor. Thank you. They're quite lovely. Nate does a great job. He, he does, here's a, he did our trophies uh, for the Lillian Smith Awards. So he does a, a wonderful job Ooh. for us. Yeah, he, he's quite talented as well. Well, I can't wait to see it. Well, I don't want to keep you all any more so you can get back to your, your evening and any art or, you know, if you have a couple bit of inspiration from, from the chat, you know, hurrying back to your studios. 
Thank you all so much for joining this evening, letting us coming into your home and talk a little bit to you about art and inspiration. Peggy, thank you so very much. And Joe, thank you so very much for coordinating this. We will see you all again next week. We have one more of these artist talks coming up. Please remember to stay safe, vote, and we will see you again very, very soon. Have a wonderful evening. Bye. Bye-bye, thanks.